Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar, Talking Cyber with our partners at ISP Squared. My name is Michelle and I am part of the marketing team here at DDLS and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly run through some housekeeping. This webinar is in listen mode only and will be recorded and distributed to all attendees at a later date. This webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box on the control panel and we'll do our best to address them all. We're also running a very special promotion for all our attendees today, which we'll address at the end of the session. Today, I am pleased to be joined by DDLS Cybersecurity Product Manager, Jeremy Daly, and ISC Squared Director of Cybersecurity Advocacy, Tony Visa. I'd now like to hand it over to Jeremy. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. I'm Jeremy Daly, and I'm the Cybersecurity Product Manager for DDLS. Joining me this afternoon is Tony Visa, who's the ISC Squared Director of Cybersecurity Advocacy and responsible for cybersecurity advocacy initiatives for the Asia Pacific region for ISC Squared, the world's largest not for profit association of certified cybersecurity professionals. Tony, thanks for taking the time to join me today. Jeremy, always a pleasure. So Tony, as we might have a number of people on the webinar today who don't know who ISC Squared are, could you just give us a quick overview, please? Yeah, sure. So um, to give you a bit of a, a, an understanding of who ISC Squared is, ISC Squared is the, the largest not-for-profit uh, membership association of certified cybersecurity professionals in the world today. And it's a, an organisation that's uh, committed to providing lifelong uh, professional security education. And also, as, as you can imagine, through my work as an advocate and as an organisation, we're an advocacy organisation, we are the global advocate for the growth and success of the cybersecurity profession around the world. Um, we do a lot of work with many uh, of the government bodies uh, around the world, a lot of not-for-profit bodies uh, and the like. And we also have a very large member base uh, around the world of 150,000 plus members today, uh, 20,000 plus in the Asia Pacific region. Here in Australia, we have a membership uh, base of over 2,800 members, and we are present in 175 countries and regions around the world. Wow. That's certainly a large membership base you have, and no doubt a terrific way for ISC Square members to actually liaise with other cybersecurity professionals globally. Now, while I'm on the subject of cybersecurity professionals, and I'm going to pick on the Australian results here, um, earlier on in the year, in the last notifiable data breaches report that was published by the government back in January, there was a 19% increase in breach notifications, amongst other things. It seems we're hearing about a new breach every other week, including this week of a very large multinational Australian beer brewery. Uh, recently got cyber breached. The other discussion I hear happening is that there's a significant cybersecurity workforce gap in Australia, but would I be wrong to also say we potentially have a knowledge gap based on what you're seeing? Um, that gap is absolutely um, proven uh, by numerous studies that have been conducted around the world. One of those studies, Jeremy, is actually one that IC Squared commissions every year, which is the uh, Cybersecurity Workforce Study. It's a study that's available through um, the IC Squared website. You can download it and it's uh, free. And what we found uh, this year, so we, we release it in November of every year. Um, in 2019, the, the last version of the study found that Overall, there is a workforce gap of over 4 million uh, cybersecurity uh, professionals today. Now, this gap represents people who um, need to have some level of cybersecurity knowledge, uh, experience and skills to be able to perform a job function. This isn't certified people, but this is people who need to have some sort of education in cybersecurity. In the Asia Pacific region where we're based, we have approximately 2.6 million shortfall. And here in Australia, we have a, a shortfall of about 47,000 uh, people. So it is a significant gap. There are other entities such as AusCyber who will publish uh, data that, that illustrates a gap of about 18 to 19,000 dedicated cybersecurity professionals uh, required in Australia. So yes, there is a significant gap um, in the world today. Now, 
Further to um, some of the comments, Jeremy, that you made in relation to um, the breaches. So if we look at the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner's report that you spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, the latest report that was released um, back in December of this, uh, sorry, in, um, it was in uh, January, uh, see, in February of this February. year, that's right, um, yeah. reflective of the period of uh, July to, Dece to December of 2019 showed that uh, the number of notifications of organisations that have actually been breached in Australia was up 19%. And there's some data on screen that shows you some of those attributes of, of that report. Um, now, this is the authoritative figure um, on cyber breaches in Australia. It's published by a government body. Um, and it goes to the heart of, of your comment around the knowledge gap that exists. Now, this has only become in many respects more profound given what's been going on in the past few months uh, with relation to, in relation to, to COVID-19. A lot of organisations have very quickly had to um, deploy uh, digital transformation, uh, as, as the, the popular term is, but they've really had to scale very quickly to allow their workers to be able to work um, from home. And as a result of that, what's happened is you've, you've actually had a magnification um, of these, these breaches. And I'm going to talk very briefly about some of these. So, this particular scene here is one that for many who, who were on the call today would, would be familiar with. And in fact, before I started today, uh, Jeremy uh, witnessed me hold my newborn. Um, and <laughs> so all of us are familiar with the working from home uh, scenario that, that we're all faced with. And a lot of us are faced with, with a lot of distractions that we deal with in, day in and day out. But that goes to, to part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, of course, many of us are using technologies deployed from, from work in a home environment and there's no structured controls around that uh, in a home network. Um, many people have a very basic router or a file or may not even have a firewall at all. Uh, their Wi-Fi password may not have been um, set up uh, or may have been set up years ago and may not have been updated. Um, the firmware on that router may be quite old. So there's actually a lot that's been going on and as a result of that what we've seen is we've actually seen a significant um, up surge in crime related to cyber breaches. Jeremy, you talked about the Lion Group and, and the, the breach that happened in the news recently. Um, they, ha they have been one of a number of high profile breaches that have occurred in Australia. And a lot of this has had to do, of course, with this, with this skills gap that exists. Some of the data on screen here will show you. Uh, in the US, the FBI have determined that the number of cybercrime reports has quadrupled since COVID-19 began. So a 400% increase in cybercrime on already incredibly high numbers that, 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 that were being reported prior to that. In Australia, the Australian Cyber Security Centre, um, who is a fantastic organisation who does a lot of work in the space around trying to protect Australians from cybercrime, is effectively reporting every second day. They're putting up some uh, information on how to protect yourself. There is a treasure trove of information for the average um, Australian to be able to access, to be able to protect themselves from scams that are taking place. And I'm sure all of us on the call have seen um, some of that um, in, in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, when I talk about um, some of the cyber um, issues that, that have been prevalent, it's important to have a look at the costs of, of what cybercrime looks like. So for the average organisation, if you're an organisation who, who is considering, um, you know, is this something that's going to cost me? IBM every year run a cost of, of data breach study. Um, and this is a, a very well received, very, very um, well reviewed study. And they do this every year. The last um, report that came out from IBM illustrated that on average, an organization, when they get breached, will cost them 3.92 million US dollars. And the cost per lost record is about $150 per record. And most concerningly is the fact that um, the time to detect a breach is 279 days. It's, 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 it approaches almost a year uh, for an organization that gets breached and it doesn't realize for, in that period of time. Now, if we want to look at the Australian numbers, you'll see here that the Australian numbers actually uh, cover, uh, it's about 2.13 million per data breach. Um, now, if you want to consider the cost per industry sector, if you look at that, that graph on your right-hand side, you realise that the average cost per record 
per industry sector is anywhere between $78 for, for public entity, so a government entity, all the way up to $429 for healthcare data. Healthcare data is the most coveted data when it comes to um, a hacker and, and what they're trying to actually sell on the dark web because it, it's just so vital. Um, and last year we had uh, the Singapore government uh, announced that their um, digital health agency got breached and a quarter of all Singaporean citizens' uh, data was, was leaked online, including the Prime Minister of Singapore, by the way. So it, it gives you an indication in terms of how um, how lucrative this actually is um, in, for, for a hacker and, and why it's so essential for organisations. But the most critical element of all of this is that PwC a couple of years ago actually ran a study to see how much it would be in terms of preventative uh, costs. So if an organization decided, okay, we're going to invest in um, all of the countermeasures and, and skills up, upskilling in order to prevent a breach, what would the cost of that be? And the cost of that for a healthcare setting was $8 per record. So if we compare $8 per record to protect versus $429 per record in healthcare to actually um, deal with a breach, it's significantly better for an organisation to actually prevent the breach than to have to deal with the breach, the media, the repercussions, the regulatory um, situation. So as part of that, it's important to understand the problem. It's important to understand why uh, an organisation gets breached in the first instance. To be breached, normally three things need to happen. Um, one is you need to have an external intruder. Um, two is you need to have a system that's been poorly uh, designed or poorly maintained or poorly monitored. And the third component as is, is you need a, a lack of user education, poor organizational processes. Now, if two of these, these three things, if two of these three things happen, typically speaking, you will have some sort of breach, whether it's an accidental breach or whether it's a deliberate breach by someone who is, um, uh, a cyber criminal. You can have an accidental breach, i.e. someone can send a, an email with a, an attachment um, that they shouldn't have sent to someone else and that's because of uh, poor organisational processes or lack of user education and, and poor system design maintenance and monitoring that prevent that from occurring. Or you can have all three and when you have all three you have the, the biggest of all problems and that's the worst instance. And cyber criminals are actually out there looking for organisations that um, have poor systems, that have poor user education, poor organisational processes. Um, over the weekend, we had a, a visitor, um, a family friend of ours who uh, the topic came up about work. And she um, said to me, she said, yeah, she said, we, we had our CEO, um, the, the, the PA of the CEO was sent a phishing email. They clicked on the email and the organisation was down for over a week. Um, costing a significant amount of money. So this is where the problem comes in. And fundamentally, it's actually a human problem. Now, if we want to actually solve the problem, dealing with the problem involves looking at three discrete areas of cybersecurity. The people aspect, the process aspect, and the technology aspect. And you can see that, that there's three concentric circles that, that correspond to this. Now, from a people perspective, we're looking at staff awareness, staff training. We're looking at professional skills and certifications and qualifications, which, which is what IC squared provide. And we're also looking at competent resources. Now, from a process perspective, you're looking at management systems, governance, um, risk compliance, best practice, and IT auditing as well. Now, these are all covered as part of the certification. So what you'll find is you'll find that an individual who is certified is actually able to assist in the process aspect um, of cybersecurity and being able to improve that process. And finally, of course, the technology aspect. This is the aspect that is much more uh, sort of attuned towards the vendor specific uh, technologies that you'll, you'll see, the Microsofts, the Cisco's, the HP's and the like. Now, it's true, you can't deploy cybersecurity unless you have the technology in place. However, what you'll find is you'll find that the certifications that are provided by IC Squared are vendor agnostic. And most environments in the world today, from an IT perspective, are multi-vendor. And vendors are fantastic at teaching you the, the skills and the uh, requirements to get that vendor working appropriately. But what about when it fits with all other vendors? That's where our certification is um, really good because it actually uh, works in a multi-vendor environment because it is completely vendor agnostic. 
And I do actually find that last side fascinating, Tony, because it, it hits home to what we're hearing from some of our students who have, who have sat in our ISC certification courses. Um, we have some who are already running their own information security programs and they need guidance on the best practices and, and how to actually do so and others that want to get the credential in order to round out their knowledge, uh, learn the correct terminology and have a credential, I guess it shows they've got the necessary experience and knowledge to manage information security within their organisation. Um, so look, why we're talking about training, well, let, let's talk training and, and let's specifically talk about the relationship that DDLS has with ISC squared. Now, DDLS are an approved ISC squared official training partner or OTP for Australia, the Philippines, and most recently, New Zealand, which is really exciting. And so for our friends from New Zealand who are joining us on the webinar today, you can now sit any of the ISC squared certification training courses that we're offering, um, which include the SSCP, the CCSP and the CISSP, which we'll cover off shortly. Our schedule for these courses is available on the DDLS website. And if you do want to book onto one of these courses, please contact us um, or feel free to reach out to me personally for more details. Now, when I talk about DDLS being an official training provider for ISC Squared, this is really important for anyone considering taking one of the ISC Squared certification courses. To be recognised as an ISC Squared official training partner, it, it, it's no easy feat and it involves a rigorous process to be approved to deliver these courses. Our trainers also go through their own rigorous process to be approved and teach an ISC certification course, uh, including holding a current certification for that particular course. Um, this is really important because it shows that they have that real world experience across the domains of each of the individual courses that they've been endorsed by ISC Squared as an, as an authorised instructor to deliver those courses. It also means as an official training provider, DDLS will only use official ISC Squared courseware and the most up-to-date content for deep awareness and understanding of new threats, technologies, regulations and best practices when we deliver a course Tony, from an ISC Squared's perspective, why, why is it important for those wanting to sit an ISC certification to actually use an official training provider? The, the main reason and the most critical reason is because the common bodies of knowledge for each of the certifications that ISC Squared uh, has is continually updated. And that's as a result of the fact that cybersecurity in itself inherently is continually changing and updating. So as that happens, we actually will uh, modify the, the common body of knowledge and the examination will be reflective of that. Now, as a result of that, that material is only made available to official training providers such as DDLS. So in order to maximise um, your learning, in order to maximise what you're going to uh, need in order to be able to successfully pass the exam, it's absolutely critical that you do uh, the official training because that's going to be reflective of what you're actually going to be tested on in the examination. Um, and of course, it, it's important to touch at this particular juncture around uh, what we term uh, to be great trainers. There, there's operators out there, given the lucrative nature of the, the certifications that we have, um, that offer uh, unofficial training. Now, um, we get uh, a lot of complaints from people who do these courses that are not sanctioned by IC squared, believing that they are, um, and we then have to deal with the fallout of that because um, it, it smears our good name in, in all of this. Meanwhile, all we, we've been saying to, to, to our um, people who are interested in wanting to do our certifications for, for a long time, you need to use an official training provider to do the training material. And DDLS is a fantastic partner. And those of you on the call who are considering an IC squared certification will be well advised to uh, look at some of the offerings that DDLS have in this space. Thanks for the endorsement. <laughs> so um, well, let, let's move on to the certifications that, that we're offering. Um, before we go into detail on the individual um, certifications, I think it's probably really important to, to get a high level understanding about, you know, about how the certifications, um, yeah, I understand a little bit about the certification requirements, the global recognitions that these certifications hold. So Tony, do you wanna go through this in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. Look, the, the certifications, there are a lot of questions from people who, who don't quite um, understand what certification is. There's a difference between, say, a certification and a certificate. Now, um, the reason why we offer what's called a certification is because what it does is it actually validates 
knowledge and real world experience. And I often talk about the fact that um, it's the certifications that we have are not entry level. They're not designed for someone who has decided that, you know, today is a good day to join the cybersecurity industry and they don't have any experience in it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in, in the next slide. Now, our certifications are recognised by government bodies, by other associations, um, and, and they've also got international accreditations. Now, in Australia, the most relevant one is the fact that the IRAP program, which is the, um, the assessors program that's endorsed by the Australian Signals Directorate, um, specifies a CISSP as a prerequisite to the IRAP program. Now, um, the IRAP program is being overhauled um, as we speak. And I know for a fact that other certifications that IC Squared uh, provide will also be uh, incorporated into part of the IRAP process as well. So it's a really good investment if you're looking to become an IRAP practitioner in Australia. The Australian Computer Society uh, has approved the IC Squared certifications as part of their accreditation. They, they offer a professional accreditation through what's called the Certified Professional and the Certified Technologist. And our certifications will come under that by the Australian Computer Society. Most importantly for us uh, as an association, our certifications are accredited under an ISO standard. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with ISO 9001 and ISO 27001. There's actually a quality control uh, accreditation for certifications and that's the ISO 17024 standard. And it's under this standard that the certifications fall under. We go through an onerous um, auditing process every single year to make sure that the certification is compliant with that um, and all of our certifications are. In the United States, the Department of Defence has two uh, standards which are the 8140 and the 8570 standards. Our certifications come under that as the Department of Defence and in Singapore they, they follow the national Infocoms framework as well. So um, in terms of recognition, um, they are globally recognised and, and highly sought after um, for, for what they actually offer. And to give you a little bit of, uh, of background, I've touched on the fact that the certifications are vendor agnostic and, and we've talked about that. But the certification requires four specific um, elements to actually attain. Um, you need to do the theoretical requirement, which is the study component and the rigorous examination uh, component. Uh, and that's where DDLS come in and offer, offer a fantastic uh, avenue in, in order to be able to achieve that tick. You also need a practical requirement, and that is um, demonstrated hands-on experience uh, in terms of cybersecurity. So you actually need to have done work and been paid for that work in order to qualify to become certified. Now, you don't need that to uh, sit the exam and, and do the study that DDLS are offering, um, but you do need that to become certified. There's also an endorsement requirement. So an existing IC squared member who is certified needs to attest to your experience and needs to attest to your good character. And you need to commit to a code of ethics. And that code of ethics effectively is that you will uh, work towards a safer and more secure cyber world. And finally, there's an ongoing requirement. Now that ongoing requirement is around continuing professional education. So when you become certified, you're certified for three years. At the end of that three years, you need to demonstrate that you have completed uh, a number of hours of continuing professional education throughout that three year process. And once you do that, then you become recertified for another three years. If you can't do that, then um, effectively your certification will lapse. And if you wanna become recertified, you need to go through the exam process all over again. So it's generally not a good idea to do that because the exams are not easy for these certifications. Um, it's best to keep doing continuing professional education now. For those of you who are considering one or a number of IC squared certifications, any study that you do that counts uh, as part of the uh, continuing as can, uh, counts as part of the, the common body of knowledge of that certification can count as a CPE. If you're doing other certifications that are not IC squared certifications, they also can count towards your CPE requirements. So it's a really good incentive um, for you to do additional study potentially through DDLS. Now. Um, Jeremy, I know that you wanted to comment a little bit about the SSCP um, certification. Yeah, look, 
Definitely. I mean, the, so the system security certified practitioner or the SSCP, um, really excited that we're able to be offering this certification. It's, it's the most recent certification that we've added to our portfolio. Um, my understanding is as well, is that this is also one of the fastest growing ISC squared certifications globally at the moment. Um, Tony, can you elaborate a bit more on that for me? Yeah, sure. And, and the reason why this certification is growing so rapidly is because we're seeing uh, a lot of people around the world who uh, come from an IT background. So they don't come from a cybersecurity background, they come from an IT background. And they've seen uh, the skills gap, they've seen that on average, people who work in cybersecurity do get paid significantly more um, you know, in their careers. So what they've decided is they've decided, you know, they, they want to get a, a bit of a head start in the cybersecurity space and they become certified in this credential because it's aimed at people who work in IT and have some element of um, background in terms of configuring networks, configuring IT resources and the like and making sure that those are configured in a secure manner. So this is why it's, it's such, a, uh, such a great certification is because um, it proves that people have uh, the advanced technical skills and knowledge in order to be able to implement, monitor, administer IT infrastructure. And that is using security best practices, policies and procedures. And the SSCP certification will go through all of that. Um, and to give you an idea in terms of some of the study areas that you have in the SSCP, um, the SSCP will cover uh, seven domains. And these seven domains are access controls, um, security operations administration, risk identification, monitoring and analysis, incident response and recovery, cryptography, network and communication security, and of course, uh, the last um, domain being systems and application security. And I was gonna add, for those of you who might be considering the certification, in terms of the experience requirements, you would need um, one year of paid experience in one of these seven areas of cybersecurity. Um, so if you're an IT administrator who's been looking at, uh, for instance, network communications uh, as part of their job, if you've done one year of paid work experience and you qualify as being, a, being a, a eligible to sit the SSCP. Um, so it is a really exciting um, certification. It's one that uh, globally is growing um, significantly and it's one that I have no doubt, Jeremy, you're, uh, you're going to have a, a lot of people interested in. Yeah, look, I, I agree, especially when you look at who, who the target audience is and, and that's why I'm really excited about this one and it is, it is teaching those individuals um, you know, the skills and knowledge around cybersecurity best practices within these different domains um, and it's a great way to to really kick off your security career. Um, so if we move on to our next certification, which is the Certified Cloud Security Professional, the CCSP, uh, this is another relatively new certification that the DDLS recently launched. Um, with adoption of, of cloud only getting bigger and bigger, it, you know, it asks the question, how do I secure myself against cloud threats? Now, Tony, you're actually a certified CCSP. Um, I'd love to hear your views on this uh, and why the CCSP is, excellent, is an excellent option for anyone responsible for their organization's cloud environment. Sure, sure. Now, um, as, as we all know, um, if we look at the cloud technologies that are, uh, that are prevalent in the world today, we've got AWS, we've got Azure, we've got Google, uh, are the three main ones. And a, a lot of cloud practitioners um, will go through training um, and will learn their craft in, in one of these um, particular cloud technologies. And, and it's fantastic. And, and those uh, particular um, uh, courses and certifications that they offer are actually really ideal. However, most organizations, in fact, are actually using multiple um, cloud technologies. They're not just using one vendor, they're using multiple ones. And that is for a variety of different reasons. Now, one of the advantages of the CCSP is that the CCSP first of all is vendor agnostic so it deals with all cloud vendors but secondly it also um, is highly uh, sophisticated in terms of going through the security controls that are specific to cloud cloud technologies are different to old school on-premise um, uh, technologies when you have to secure them and the ccsp is uh, strikes at the heart of that and deals with that to give you an example, Microsoft um, in the region, in the Asia Pacific region, and now deploying it globally, are actually getting all of their engineers CCSP certified because they understand um, that having a, a vendor agnostic, pure cybersecurity uh, certification is highly 
um, advantageous when it comes to making sure that their own cloud deployments are secure. And the, the CCSP is ideal for people who are cloud security leaders and professionals uh, that recognizes people who work in information security, who understand cloud security strategy and hands-on implementation. Um, I was uh, sent an article uh, a couple of days ago that talked about the top 12 trends in cloud security uh, breaches that are occurring uh, in the world today. And we've all seen that, we've talked about that in, as part of this presentation. And as I was reading through this list of, of 12, as, as a CCSP person that, that, that I'm certified as, I was looking at this going, hang on, I've, I've, we've, I've seen this in the courseware that I've done. I've seen this in, in, in the exam. I've seen this in, in the material that we have. So for me, this was all um, old news, but clearly it's not been talked about openly enough. And as a result of this, we're seeing organizations getting breached. As a professional, if you have knowledge and experience designing, developing and, and managing an organization, cloud security posture, this certification is perfect for you and it's highly advantageous and highly sought after. To, to give you some background in terms of the domain areas that the CCSP covers, the CCSP covers um, six domain areas, cloud concepts, architecture and design, cloud data security, cloud platform and infrastructure security, cloud application security, cloud security operations and legal risk and compliance. They're the six areas to become certified you need to have five years of experience working in information technology, three years of experience working in a security related area of that information technology, and one year of experience in one of these six areas uh, of, of knowledge that the CCSP covers. So one of these six areas that you see on screen. Um, and Jeremy, I'm sure that uh, you've, you've probably already fielded a fair few inquiries on the certification and there'll be a lot more to come. Yep. And look, and to, to echo what Tony said, if you are responsible for managing your organization's you know, cloud security workloads, um, definitely have a look at this certification. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, I think it's worthwhile having. Um, it's going to, uh, you know, it's going to, to ensure that as a professional, you know, you have these knowledge and skills and the experience to protect your organizations from any cloud security challenges that might come up. Sure. And I was just going to add to that, um, for many people who might already be CISSPs, uh, as, as I was uh, and I still am, um, the CCSP is a very natural um, certification to add um, purely because of the fact that it's, it's so cloud focused. The CISSP, which we'll talk about in the next slides, is much more broad in, in terms of certifications, whereas the CCSP is, is much more cloud focused. And Tony, my understanding is as well that if you hold a, a CISSP um, and then you successfully pass the, the CCSP exam, you're automatically certified. Yeah, the, the endorsement happens automatically, so you don't need to go through that process of endorsement that I talked about earlier. And, and IFC Squared also charges an annual maintenance fee as part of your certification. You only pay one annual maintenance fee, regardless of how many certifications that you hold. So um, for many people, it's, it's, it's simple common sense for them to decide to do the CCSP if they're working in the cloud space. It doesn't cost them any extra um, as a, on an annual basis. Great. All right, so let's move on to our final uh, course. So this course needs no introduction. So the Certified Information System Security Professional or the CISP is probably one of the most globally recognized and highly regarded cybersecurity certifications. Um, certainly from DLS's point of view, it's one of our most popular courses. Um, one that we see a high level of demand for. Tony, as a CISP holder yourself, um, what do you have to say about this certification? Yeah, it's it's um that's a, it's a great introduction, and ordinarily I would go through and and talk about much of the stuff that's on screen, and I will hint on that. But a lot of people do ask me, and they go, "Oh, Tony, you know, what's the value of the CISSP for me?" And I I say very simply, I go, "Look, I go go to seek.com.au, go to keyword search, and type in CISSP, and let me know if the roles that come up as part of that search and what they're offering in terms of pay uh, would it would it interest you and attract you." So very often when I talk about the CISSP, I talk about th this from a career development perspective, but from a professional perspective, you're gonna find that what you're gonna learn as part of the CISSP uh, training that you do is really gonna expand your knowledge of cybersecurity because it covers the A to Z of cybersecurity. It will literally cover uh, the, the breadth of 
uh, the field, um, all the way from cryptography, all the way to governance risk compliance, all the way to the laws related to cyber, all the way to backup disaster recovery, even talking about physical security. And some people will turn around and go, oh, you know, but, but why am I doing physical security as part of cyber? Years ago, there was a very famous hacker who was uh, asked at a convention to um, compromise a system. And what he did was he opened up a, a toolkit. Uh, so, so the system was sitting there in a rack. He opened up a toolkit, he unscrewed the system out of its rack and he put it under his arm and he walked off. That is a data breach and that is caused by a physical lapse in security. And the CISSP will also talk about that. It's ideal for people who are security leaders and operations staff, as indicated on screen. It is designed for people who are information security leaders who understand cybersecurity strategy and hands-on implementation. And it proves that professionals have the knowledge and experience to design, develop and manage an organization's overall cybersecurity posture. And if we look at the domain areas of the CISSP, um, it is covered by eight specific domains. Uh, and these domains will cover uh, the, link, the length and breadth of the cybersecurity field, uh, as I've illustrated earlier. Now, uh, many people who look at this get a little bit daunted because they look at this and they go, hang on, I don't have experience in all eight of these areas. I might have experience in only two or three of these areas. That is perfectly natural. Most cybersecurity professionals, even over the course of 10, 15 years, will only have access into a couple of areas in depth. And the CISSP requires for you to become certified that you have experience of five years paid and cumulative experience in two of these eight areas. So we understand in becoming certified that you probably have not done all these eight areas on a day-to-day -day, um, level, but the training that you're gonna do will help you understand those areas. When you get examined, you'll be able to actually understand and get the right answer. Um, so this is the reason why um, we, we, we do um, endorse the training because it will really help you um, with that. Now, the, the eight areas of the CISSP, security and risk management, asset security, security architecture and engineering, communication and network security, identity and access management, security assessment and testing, security operations and software development security. As you can see, it covers um, the length of breadth of cybersecurity. Jeremy, over to you. So Tony, rumour has it that when you passed your CISP, you did a little dance in the street. Um, yeah, I, I remember, I remember confirm texting. Confirm or deny that? Well, I, I won't, I refuse to confirm or deny, but I will say, I will say that um, when I did pass this exam, it was probably one of the hardest exams I have sat and I am not, uh, I'm not uh, a novice when it comes to sitting exams. Uh, I'm, I'm two and a half, you know, I'm through my third degree, halfway through that. And I can tell you this is one of the hardest exams that I sat. Um, fortunately, I, I was well prepared because I had done training. I had spent a significant period of time studying. Um, in fact, my partner got sick to death of asking me questions uh, every day, uh, sample questions out of the study guides, um, you know, that, that you'd test me on. Um, but it is um, highly fulfilling when you do um, pass the exam and, and get this. And for me, it, it genuinely has changed my life. And by the way, I, I had no no, um, I had no idea I was ever going to work for IC Squared, who, who run the CISP when I got this. It, it hadn't even entered my mind, um, but I saw the value in it. And, and when IC Squared did approach me uh, a couple of years back, um, I jumped on it because I saw the value of the certification and uh, absolutely believe in it. So, um, yeah, over to you. And we've, we've, just had, we've just had a comment come through actually from John Martin saying everyone does that when they pass. It's a tremendous, tremendous achievement. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's... That's good, and hopefully we'll see more people dancing. Um, look, that, that's a great overview, Tony, of, of all the certifications, and, and certainly with the CIS there, it, it definitely paints a picture of why, why that certification itself is so popular and, and so highly regarded. Um, look, that's, that's it. We're coming towards the end of, of the presentation today. So, Tony, first of all, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I do know how busy you are. Um, it's, it's always great when we get together and have a chat, you know, um, and I'm looking forward to getting back together to have a coffee with you as well soon. Um, but it's been great to have you share some of your wisdom here today. Thank you so much. And it's always, uh, always a huge honour to, um, to be able to, to talk about cybersecurity and hopefully for some of your audience, um, get them on the path of, um, of finding what a, a fantastic um, career this can be for them.
In terms of, and in fact, I, I want to bring something up that you have discussed with me a few times. Um, one of the questions we get is around, you know, what what's the best career path, or should I be doing that, or you know, how does how does an IC squared certification fit in? You have a great analogy that you've uh, spoken to me about before. Do you want to share that with with everyone on the webinar today? Yeah, absolutely, and and it's one that um, I actually shared last week. Um, I did a I did a webinar last week for the Victorian government, who uh, have a fantastic uh, initiative um, of wanting to get uh, all of their um, cyber workers. Uh, certified uh, because they see the value in it. They've had a couple of, of problems uh, over the last couple of years in terms of um, uh, breaches that they've had. They had one in the healthcare sector last year uh, that, that made the news. So they're looking at getting uh, people certified and, and we've been asked to assist them with that. And I know DDLS have also been asked to as, as part of this process. Um, and what I explained to them, I said, look, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with the vendor technologies and the vendor technologies are all really, really good and, and absolutely you should become uh, educated in all of those. But I want you to think of our certifications in, in a, a, a similar vein to, um, for those of you who have ever uh, considered a career in, in aviation, uh, to become a pilot, what you need to do, anyone can become a pilot, but to become a pilot, what you need to do is you need to go through what's called the private pilot's license. And the, the, the way to do that is that you need to go through and actually fly an aircraft. So you get to fly a single engine Cessna uh, aircraft. Um, you also, um, as part of that, need to do a bunch of exercises that you're, uh, you're given as part of all of that. Then you also need to pass a, um, an exam, which is called the Basic Aeronautical Knowledge, the BAC. And then you also need to pass a medical uh, and get security clearances. Um, and once you've done all of that, you become a pilot, uh, you, be, you, you get your, your PPL, your private pilot's license um, course. Now, that does not give you um, open slather to go and fly a, an Airbus A380 or a 747. What it gives you, it gives you the ability to fly a single engine Cessna or a single engine Piper aircraft. The certifications that we have, um, in many ways, uh, similar to that, because they will teach you everything to do with cybersecurity from an A to Z. The same way the private pilot's license teaches you all the fundamentals of flight. Without it, you can't fly an Airbus A380, but they're not gonna teach you how to fly an, Air, an A380. They're gonna, they're gonna um, give you the fundamentals of all of that. It's the vendor um, credentials that'll teach you how to fly specific models of aircraft. Um, and there was an analogy that, that was raised very recently, Jeremy, um, in that there's also another pilot's uh, license, which is to fly a double uh, engine aircraft. So a single engine aircraft analogy is effectively the SSCP. In order to fly a commercial aircraft that has two engines, then that's what the CISSP is all about. Um, but truth be told, the CISSP works uh, even better when you're combining it with other um, industry um, vendor uh, related type um, credentials such as the Amazon, such as the Microsoft, such as the Veeams and the like. Um, and it's gonna create a really well-rounded cybersecurity professional if you have both, um, because they complement each other so well. Great analogy. I've been a fan of aviation, I love it even more. <laughs> even better. Uh, yes, yep. So look, for the audience today, um, we want to open the floor up, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have uh, while we've got Tony here. We've also got one of our CISP instructors um, on the call as well in the back end to help answer any questions that might come through. If you don't have any questions, please use the, the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen and uh, we'll read some of those out as they come through. Excellent. And, and I mean, I suppose we could start with, with a question which um, I, I get asked quite frequently, which is around the, the recertification piece. So a lot of people do get a little bit mystified um, as to what happens once you, you, uh, your three years is up. Uh, like I said earlier, um, it really involves doing um, that continued professional education piece and making sure that your skills are up to speed and current. And a lot of people say, why, why, did, why do we have to do that? Well, because the certifications are, are an ISO accredited, it's actually part of the ISO accreditation that we have to do that. Um, and this is where, you know, as a well-rounded cybersecurity professional, um, continuing professional education comes as part of the territory. It's, uh, this stuff is changing um, day by day, um, hour by hour, and it's, it's absolutely uh, incumbent on that professional to, to make sure that their skills and experience are continually 
um, refreshed, um, reinforced, uh, and anything new that happens is, is, is part and parcel of, um, of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's one question. Um, Jeremy, what, what do you hear as questions uh, typically from, from candidates that, that approach DDLS? Which, which course should I do? That, yep. that comes up quite a lot. Um, you know, how, how experienced do I need to be to, to do the CISP? How hard is it? Um, you know, I, I don't actually have the paid work experience. And I, I think an important part of that conversation that, that we have, and certainly I've, I've had it with quite a few um, clients and, and internally within the team is that if, if you don't have the prerequisites, it's, it's not an issue. You can actually still sit the exam. You can pass the exam. You just become associated. And then you have a length of time to actually complete the, the paid experience within the, the required demands for that certification. So don't be put off by the fact if you don't actually um, meet all the all the requirements to be certified. Um, you can still sit and pass the exam. You can be um, associated member. You then have a certain amount of time to do it. But it, it, it really come does come back to you know which which certification should I do? Um, yeah. You know and what what order should I do? Do I need to do them all? Um, yeah. Do I only need to do this? So that that's yeah. what we're hearing. Um, I, a, I was going to I was going to add to that uh, to to that. Um, that yes, that, that's very much true. So you, you hinted on the associate program that we have. So even if you don't have the prerequisite years of experience that's required under each of the certification, and, and I talked about that a little bit earlier, you can become what's called an associate. So what it means is it means you can sit the exam, pass the exam um, and, and work towards full membership. And when you have those number of years of experience that you can then prove, you don't need to go sit the exam again. You've, you've you then become fully uh, accredited and certified at that point in time. And it's a really popular program, particularly for people who, uh, for instance, say the SSCP, they might have six months of work experience mm -hmm. and not 12 months. Now, the other thing also that I should have talked about when, when we did the presentation earlier was that the SSCP, if you have an undergraduate computer science degree or an IT degree, that 12 month requirement uh, of work experience is waived. So you don't need that 12 uh, months of um, work experience if you have a uh, full um, cybersecurity, uh, IT or um, computer science uh, degree that's recognized. For the CISSP, uh, you take a year off if you have a, a computer science or an IT degree or a cybersecurity degree. So instead of five years of experience, you only need four years of experience. So um, there is recognition for prior learning that um, you have done. We've had a question and, come through. So yep. This one's from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, what does a typical cybersecurity career look like? Well, I mean, they've started well because their name's Anonymous, right? Sorry, that's a terrible dad joke. Um, so how, what does a typical cybersecurity career look like? Now, um, it's, it's quite un, unknown to many people who are outside of the industry that um, cybersecurity is, is a, a field of different uh, roles and responsibilities and disciplines. You could potentially do a career um, within uh, pen testing, and I know that's a very popular one to talk about. Uh, a lot of uh, people get fascinated by what pen testing looks like. You could potentially work uh, as a governance risk and compliance person. You could work as a uh, security analyst um, or as a person who is um, hardening uh, IT systems or networks and the like. You could even be working in areas such as cyber insurance, cyber law uh, and the like. So what does a typical cybersecurity career look like? There's really no answer um, because there's just so much that you can do within that field. My suggestion to you would be, if you are looking at a, a career, have a look at what really sort of, um, you know, floats your boat, ticks your interests and, and look at what would be a requirement to be able to achieve that career in terms of what you should learn, um, what you should study, um, and what work experience you should have. Um, I'm the first person to say to you that um, the IC squared certifications uh, are not for everyone because there are a lot of people who might potentially be looking at uh, pen testing and, and that's all they want to do in terms of their career. And if they're doing that, then there's a bunch of really good certifications that, that, um, that DDLS do that 
that actually help in that space. Um, and in time, you might want to, uh, you know, expand your career and, and go, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to work just in pen testing. Um, I'll actually, you know, do something else in, in cybersecurity and, and broaden my horizon. And that might be the right time to actually talk to us about a certification and, and, and doing that. So um, there's no real answer to what a typical cyber career looks like. Hope that's been a bit insightful for you. Another one come through. So question is, if I'm coming from an IT audit and operations, customer service orientated background, would you recommend that I take a certification? And if so, which one? And how do you think that would help my career advancement? Right, and, and that's a really, really good question. So um, the good news for you is that having that audit and operations background is actually really advantageous to cybersecurity because, um, so I, I have I have an auditing background in cybersecurity. I am, um, besides the IC squared certifications that you, you would have um, heard me speak about, I'm also an ISO 27001 senior lead auditor. So I've done, I've done a little bit of this stuff. Um, what, um, what will be really advantageous uh, for you would be a certification like the SSCP or the CISSP because we actually talk about auditing governance risk compliance as part of those certifications. So depending on the level of experience that you have, you might want to consider one or the other. In your instance, I'd probably err towards the side of the CISSP um, purely because of the fact that it's going to cover a lot more in terms of the auditing um, function. Um, and the, the way it's going to help you, again, it's going to give you a, a, an insight into how, um, how in-depth the cybersecurity uh, field is. Um, and uh, it's going to give you a lot of experience around all those specific domains. And when you do, if you decided to do something such as ISO 27001 and, and become a, an auditor, um, or potentially um, the CISA, which is an ISARC certification that goes to auditing as well, what you'll find is you'll find that that background is going to really be helpful um, because a lot of the time to be an auditor in cybersecurity, you do need to understand all of those aspects of cybersecurity. And, and I, I actually recommend to you, have a look at the ISO 27001 standard because it'll actually talk about what you need to know and you'll realise that a lot of what you do in the CISSP will actually correspond to that. So it's going to help you significantly. I should probably add, coming to the end of the financial year, it's actually a really good time to consider doing training as well. Um, yeah. I think, look, I'm, I'm pretty sure most training you do, if it's for your career, um, can actually be claimed back as a tax deduction as well. Um, it's also a great time for organisations to, you know, if you've got any budget left over, you want to put people through booking for training, you know, now, now's the time to look at doing it as well. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's uh, it's actually really advantageous that the timing um, of of the webinar because you know we're at the we're in the first uh, week and a bit of June, uh, we have till the 30th of June. Um, if you are working in IT or in cybersecurity and you're looking at furthering your career, um, it's best to talk to your financial, uh, you know, your accountant and the like. But you should be able to claim um, any costs of any coursework and the exam on um, as a tax deduction. So you should be able to do that. Um, again, talk to your accountant because they're the ones who, who can verify that. Um, but I know I've done it in, in previous years. Um, so it's actually really, really good for organizations. Of course, it's a, it's a fantastic OPEX if you need to, um, uh, you know, spend some budget before the end of financial year and, uh, and, and get an advantage there as well. Um, like I hinted at, at earlier, um, the training piece is, going to be the piece that's going to really help organisations deal with the cyber issue. There was a recent comment um, by a, a senior government figure that said 99.9% .9 of breaches occur because of human um, reasons. Either a firewall wasn't configured properly or someone has sent an email that they shouldn't have sent or um, someone's left a, an AWS bucket unsecured. Um, and this training and these certifications go to the heart of dealing with the human aspects of cybersecurity. Um, and they're um, highly, um, highly valuable from that perspective. Fantastic. So we haven't had any more questions come through. Um, um, uh, actually sorry, yes, there. we have. Yes, yeah. we have. Here we go. Uh, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's just coming on my screen now. Um, so from a web developer with no IT or network management background perspective, how hard would it be to begin cybersecurity training and how best should I start? Okay. So, so if you've had background in, in coding, 
um, and the like, then you already have a fairly good background in secure uh, in, in software development. And you'll find that if you look at these at the certification domains for the SSCP and the CISSP, um, software um, and secure software development is actually covered um, in those. So um, truth be told, you actually have some of the experience that's required as part of the, um, the experience requirements for the SSCP definitely and the CISSP partially. Um, that is why the training is going to be really, really useful because it will actually go through all of that and actually teach you um, what's, what's required as part of that certification. Um, so for you, particularly the SSCP is probably going to be the most suitable because it's going to go through all of that and, and the training will go through and, and teach you everything that's required, um, particularly with your background that you'll be able to leverage to, to become certified. Um, but I wouldn't let that stop you because this, that's what the training's for. That's why the training is, is five days worth of training. Um, it is very intensive. Uh, and if you look at the material that it covers, it'll go through all of that for you. Um, um, it will be hard work, but you should be able to do it. That's that's my advice. Jeremy, your thoughts? Oh, look, I, I agree. I think the the SSCP is probably the one to look at there. Um, you know, and yes, there will be areas that you may need to go out, you'll need to study. It is a very intense course. It's a 40 hour course over five days. Um, but certainly that's, that's where I'd be recommending that you start. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, well, we're getting towards the end. Um, so well, lastly, and Michelle touched on it earlier, um, for everyone who's joined us today, we're gonna be actually sending out a special offer on training for our upcoming SSCP and CCSP courses. So keep an eye out on your inboxes for that. Tony, can't thank you enough for your time again this afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure. And I'll now hand over to Michelle to finish out the webinar. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so I believe that's all we have time for today, which brings us to the conclusion of today's session. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, we'll be sending across the recording along with our special webinar attendee promotion. I'd like to thank everyone for joining the webinar today and a big thank you to our speakers, Jeremy and Tony. I hope you all have a lovely day. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Cool.